Good morning and welcome to the 25th Metrological Seminar organized by Ghana Metrological Agency, KNUST and GCRF African Swift. Today we are going to be looking into the opportunities and challenges of empirical statistical downscaling of precipitation in Ghana. In Ghana, we are actually dependent on rain-fed agriculture and also hydrological systems to generate electricity. So it will be very important if we could look into the challenges of empirical statistical downscaling in precipitation to know the trends of precipitation in the coming years. Today, the person going to take us through this topic is actually a young scientist interested in improving research skills in climate modeling, which is info informatics and also related topics. He is specifically interested in how many how uh, atmospheric processes and contemporary climate changes shape the Earth's surface, and is actually in the person of Mr. Daniel Boatzen. Sir, please, you are welcome. Yeah, hello. Sir, please, you are welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so you can share your screen and actually start with the start with the presentation. Okay, I don't know if you can see my screen now. No, please. Okay, we can see now. Okay, let me try to. Can you still see it? Yes, please, you can see. Okay, and is my voice loud enough? Yes, please. Okay, that, that's great. So you tell me to start, then I, I can start. Yeah, please, you can start. Ah, okay, uh, great. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express uh, my gratitude uh, to the organizers for providing me with this opportunity to discuss this important topic. Uh, the focus of this presentation is basically to advocate that the community comes together and find a better way of providing accurate high resolution climate change information across Ghana. And this has led me to the topic of exploring the opportunities and challenges of empirical statistics on scaling of precipitation in Ghana. Before I go into details, uh, I would like to emphasize that this has been uh, a team effort of myself, uh, Michael, Dr. Jeffrey, Frank, and Sebastian, and they've all contributed equally to the ideas uh, behind this work. So as an outline of my presentation, I will uh, start with some regional climate change implications, and I will highlight the importance and challenges of uh, 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 empirical statistical downscaling. I will introduce our new way of doing this using machine learning and kind of share some promising results that we have at the moment by highlighting our model performance and also the aesthetic uh, feature trends of rainfall across Ghana in response to different emission scenarios. And basically at the end of my talk, I will highlight some key areas uh, of this downscaling approach that can be improved uh, in, in future research. So back to the, the regional climate change uh, uh, impact. So as you can see from this uh, kind of very beautiful, but very critical uh, animation provided by NASA, basically showing the global mean uh, surface temperature anomaly since pre-industrial, it's obvious that the world has been warming at a significant rate, basically, which is uh, exceed 1 degrees, which is also expected to kind of even reach or exceed 1.5, a decrease warming in the coming years. And basically this has lead to huge implications such as uh, the occurrence of extreme climate events and many other related uh, climate change impacts. And the uh, recent IPPC report also kind of highlights that uh, these climate change implications will be very, very high spatial in, in, in terms of regional scale. It means that the, the impact on the regional scale is different and the impact for, for instance, on the continent, African continent will be different from the impact uh, on, on the European continent. And basically, this has led to the fact that developing countries will, will suffer most because they have low uh, kind of uh, adaptation capacity and also they are very highly vulnerable. So for instance, Ghana is uh, very vulnerable to the, to the rising of sea level 
uh, in terms of uh, we live in, uh, many of us living up, uh, along the coast. We are also exposed to a lot of flooding and, and drought risk. And also probably we'll be exposed to very extreme temperatures that will make life very uncomfortable. And in terms of implication, we, we really highly depend on hydropower uh, production in terms of uh, energy generation. And also uh, many of our, our communities rely on green fed uh, uh, rain fair agriculture, which means that uh, climate change will have a significant impact on people living on agriculture areas and also people living uh, along the coast. As you can see from this image showing down the recent flooding event that has happened in Ghana. So basically, uh, a way that we, we know that uh, the, the, the trends of future climate is basically we, we rely on global uh, climate change, uh, uh, global climate models. So these are uh, the set of uh, kind of uh, understanding of atmospheric physics, and we use this to predict the, the future climate uh, trends. And basically, this is also they have the same physics such as the one that we use in our weather forecasting models. And, and, and the idea is that if we use this, we can kind of prescribe possible emission scenarios in the form of atmospheric CO2 concentration for us to kind of simulate the expected global warming uh, in the future. As you can see from this plot, that shows that from the IPPC report that, you know, simulated this using global climate model in a way of prescribing uh, the different emission scenarios in the form of uh, socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic uh, pathways. As you can see, moving from low emission to high emission, basically indicating that you know, if we do not really do anything about climate change, we experience a warming of even up to uh, 18 degrees in terms of uh, global mean uh, uh, surface temperature. But since this tool, even though this tool is very important in, in predicting future climate, they have some limitations. As you can see from this uh, 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 animation, you can see that the, the grades that these models are basically used are very, very low. They have a very low resolution, which means that they are not really suitable for kind of designing uh, an impact assessment on the regional scale that will be required for, for, for making decisions on the regional scale. And moreover, also because uh, they are very computationally expensive in terms of uh, it requires a lot of resources to run these particular models, they are not flexible enough for individual uh, countries to perform their own simulations to kind of uh, uh, analyze the potential impact of uh, uh, climate change. Moreover, we also know that uh, these global climate models, because they are very coarse in resolution, they, they suffer from uh, systematic biases, especially in the tropics, leading to inaccurate predictions uh, in terms of uh, future uh, patterns. So basically, the way that this is uh, sometimes resolved is to find a better way of downscaling uh, this global climate model output, which is very low resol resolution, onto a very high resolution that is really uh, useful for doing impact uh, assessment studies. So basically, this, does, this leads us to the topic of uh, downscaling. So there are two major ways of doing this in terms of translating this low resolution global climate model output to higher resolution. And the first one is what we call the dynamic downscaling, which is basically uh, using regional climate models to kind of uh, model for a specific region by providing the, the boundary condition from the global climate model output. Present the, the particular region with specific equation, but it kind of used statistical approach to establish the relationship between the global climate model outputs and, and weather stations or a regional scale uh, or a particular region by basically using a statistical uh, transfer function to establish the relationship between the global climate model and also observation. And with this statistical downscaling, basically we have uh, 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 three main categories. We have the what we call the bias correction and the perfect prognosis and the, and the weather generator. The bias correction is basically good. What it does is that it uses the global climate models directly and kind of bias corrected uh, their, their, their predictions by, you, by matching the distribution of a particular uh, observation in a specific region. The weather generators are also very useful in, a term, in terms of downscaling. Basically, what it does is that it uses uh, a stochastic models of meteorological variables that are explicitly that explicitly model the marginal distribution and temporal dependence of a particular observation. And the perfect prognosis approach, which is the focus of this presentation, is also 
a, a very widely used in a sense that it uses real analysis or large scale observation and, and station measurements to establish the relationship and later coupled it with, with the global climate models to generate future predictions. So the advantage of this approach is that one is very less expensive because it's a, a statistic. You do not need a high performance computer to run them and they are flexible because you, in, you can also couple them to many GCMs or may, many global climate models without necessarily relying on one particular GCM. And they are widely used in, in, in terms of uh, its simplicity. And, and in the end, they are also kind of bias free because they do not rely on GCM's output, but they rely on last observations. So that's where the term perfect comes in, in place that they are perfect in the sense that they are bias free. So this will be the, the focus of uh, our, our pre presentation today, basically trying to highlight the best way of performing perfect prognosis in Perica as a down scale in, in Ghana. So before we go into details of the empirical statistical downscaling, since I'm not seeing anybody uh, because of sharing my screen, I just want to know if everything is fine. You can hear me. If the organizers can hear me, maybe they should just give me a, thump, a thumbs up so that I can continue. Yes, please, you can hear you. Okay, and the screen sharing is also working because I see people uh, joining. Yes, please, it's working. And, I, and does it come on the screen for yes. you to see? Because I'm, oh, okay. Yes, it does. I don't know. How, how can I fix this? <laughs> uh, okay, so I hope probably doesn't really disturb the presentation again. Okay, so back to the topic. I wanted to make sure that everyone understands this. That's why uh, I stopped to for for the clarity. So this is uh, uh, the, the what is basically empirical scale down scaling is all about. So the idea is that from this thematic diagram. So as you can see, we have station measurements. So example, uh, weather station measurement provided by GMS, and we have a reanalysis data set, example, ERA-5, which is prov provided by ECMWF. And basically, ERA-5 is just a, a global network of observations that are that are really kind of globally graded using data assimilation framework, using numerical models and, and observations. And the, the reason is that even though they, they rely on numerical models, but the variability of ERA-5 is controlled by the observation uh, of the network across the whole group. So the idea is that we take error five and we take uh, uh, any specific uh, observation, it can be temperature, it can be precipitation, and we put this in a machine learning framework, then we will learn from each other. So the stations will uh, learn from the last two observation from error five in, in a way that you know we will get an established uh, machine learning model, which is already calibrated. And we will, when, when this is already established, then we will feed the global, uh, global climate models output that I just previously introduced in the sense that they have a lot of limitations. You will fit this into the machine learning model and, and they will also extract the features that was learned from the era five, then they will use this to kind of generate a high resolution station based uh, downscale feature predictions. This is very important because as you can see, the machine learning models learn from the era five and, and, and the radar station and, and to establish the model, they do not, comes from the GCMs, which has a lot of limitation in terms of uh, cost, its cost resolution, and also in, in terms of its uh, low, low resolution. So I'll go into details with, uh, with this approach, uh, which we call the empirical cut down scaling. So basically, here I'm trying to kind of uh, highlight some of the challenges of this particular approach. So as you can see from this particular plot, since uh, uh, to, uh, since, since uh, 2022, we, we have seen that there are many publications about this approach trying to highlight uh, different methods of doing climate downscaling. As you can see, we have more than 300 publications as of, as of 2022. And because of this, it's very, very challenging in the sense that you do not have a well-defined framework of doing this approach because every particular study uses different methods and every particular climate variable also uses different methods. So if a researcher wants to do downscaling for a specific region, there's a lot of information to, to, to find which is the optimal way of doing this. And basically, so what I'm trying to highlight here is that since we do not have a defined protocol of doing downscaling, it makes it very difficult to, to do downscaling for a specific region to get a consistent result because every study is using its own method. And this is highlighted in a sense that you know there's lack of training in doing this. We do not have a well-defined training set that 
kind of educate people that this is the right way of doing downscaling. And also the most of the results that are published in downscaling are not reproducible because they, they use their own approach and they do not share the way they did it in the sense that other researchers cannot produce the results that they have. In the sense of, in, in terms of new technologies, there are new models that are coming every day and, and it's very hard to track the progress of these uh, new technologies in the sense that, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult that you, you cannot say that, okay, this is the state of art uh, of, of, of downscaling models and I'm, I'm going to rely on this particular method. And also uh, the way to combine uh, and communicate this prediction from this empirical statistical downscaling is also challenging because like I said, there's a wide spread of papers and it, there's no defined uh, uh, protocol of doing this in, in, in the right way. And also accessibility of these models is a problem because most researchers, when they define or when they develop a method of a way of doing this, they do not share the, the, the code or the software that they use to produce this and basically only share the results in publication, which is also very difficult for researchers to reproduce this approach. And lastly, like I said, this all has led to inconsistent protocols of, of finding a way of doing this uh, downscale. And this kind of study tries to kind of address it by providing kind of an open source and well developed framework of doing this, specifically using it for Ghana. Now, back, back to Ghana in terms of our challenges in doing downscaling, like I said, because of many publications, like in, in the papers that I read about Ghana, basically the modeling framework that people use to do this downscaling is not effectively communicated. And number two, they, like I said, many, many studies also use different methods. So for instance, you can get a catchment in Ghana, like uh, 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 the Blackboard catchment or a catchment somewhere, and you see that one study used one method, the same, set, the same study area, another study will also use another method, and basically it has lead to inconsistent results of downscale information across Ghana. And most of the papers that are, that are published about downscaling in Ghana are highly irreproducible in the sense that they lack uh, one, they do not share the methods that they use and two, the data that they use to generate, generate this downscaling product are also not available. So it's a bit, it's a, it becomes a big problem, uh, it becomes problematic because if you have a, a published uh, a work about the future trends of certain variables in Ghana and they are not reproducible, then it means that researchers cannot continue your work and it limits the application of science in solving climate change impact. And last but not the least, most of the papers published in Ghana uh, are mostly highly overfitted in the sense that sometimes they report that the calibration uh, results or calibration metrics of their models has a, a score or what we call the kind of uh, 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 machine learning in the sense of uh, coefficients of determination, basically explaining how much, basically explaining the performance of model. They report that they have 100% performance, which is very, very problematic and not unrealistic uh, because most of these models do not really show that they, are, they have 100% accuracy. So as you can see from this plot, that was uh, an, an in comparison of methods across Europe by this particular paper highlighting basically the, the performance of uh, different models uh, kind of uh, across uh, uh, Europe. You can see that most of the results were highly less than uh, 100% which means that the ones that are reported in papers in Ghana are highly overfitted and do not kind of account for the uncertainties of their prediction. And like I said, one challenge is also that we do not have like publicly available accurate longer weather station records in Ghana, which also limits research because if one person is interested in generating this for Ghana and do not have right access to data, then it becomes a very, challenge, becomes a very uh, a big challenge for the person to kind of uh, provide this accurate information across Ghana. So basically with all these challenges about empirical statistical downscaling explain, uh, what I'm trying to advocate is that the community comes together to define a protocol of doing a, a downscaling or providing high resolution climate change information across Ghana. We can design experiments, we can design validation schemes that everybody will follow in the sense that we all come together as a community to do this and provide a very useful information about climate change across Ghana. Now back to the main objective uh, of this particular uh, work, which is basically exploring the opportunities of empirical statistical downscaling. What we are trying to do here is that first we are trying to highlight some of the challenges by using a robust modeling framework with strict 
performance metric in, in doing this. Number two, what we are trying to do is also to kind of extend this empirical scale down scaling method using machine learning and artificial intelligence modeling framework. We want to make this modeling routine open source for, so that everybody can use it and also improve it. And what we are also trying to do is that in the end, we are trying to kind of highlight the opportunities or key areas of research that we can really come together as a community to improve, to ensure that we have accurate projection of climate change information across Ghana. And at the end of the day, if we're able to provide this accurate high resolution information uh, across Ghana, we can use this to couple the sector models like hydro system models to kind of predict the uh, water availability or flood susceptibility or any climate risk impact assessment models can be uh, coupled to these high resolution downstairs models to have a very uh, impactful or a very adequate information about climate change uh, impact across the country. So back to what we have uh, kind of introduced. So basically, we kind of introduced a, pa a package in Python, what we call PyEST, and that kind of take care of all the modeling cycles of uh, empirical subscar down scale in, in the form of perfect prognosis, as I introduced in the previous presentation. So basically, it's simple. What we have is that, you know, like I mentioned, you have real analysis data like R5, you have station observation like ZMET, you feed into a machine learning routine, which basically goes through predictor selection and construction. We have also model, different model selection in terms of you can select different models that you want. Uh, we have uh, different training and validation evalu evaluation metrics that you can basically use. And at the end of the day, if this all process are well calibrated and established, then we can basically couple the GCM output uh, into this particular uh, established model. Then we can have our downscale data, which we can use for many climate change impact assessment like drought and flooding. So this is a very complicated approach in terms of uh, uh, doing this. And the Python package that we introduced do this in a very few lines of code that even if you are not very good in coding, we're just writing some few lines of code, you can reproduce all this whole process and get your downscale data to have an idea about how rainfall is going to change in a specific region or a specific station. If you want to read more about the model that we, we, we developed, you can check our model description paper that you can find in, in this particular reference. And we have tested this model by applying to some weather stations across uh, southwestern Germany, where I'm currently finishing my PhD. And, and the results show that the approach was uh, very, uh, the results show that the approach was very, is very promising. And we tried to kind of also use this uh, to kind of test how this can be done across Ghana. And if you also want to use the code, everything is open source. You can find it on GitHub. If you want to contribute or if you want to learn how to use it, you can reach out and I'm willing to kind of provide information about, about approach in, in doing this. So now back to basically what we have to do uh, for Ghana. So I was first start with the data that is used by this particular model. So first is we use a monthly rainfall data. We start with monthly because that's much complicated to kind of model the seasonality in a particular rainfall uh, data. So we, we started with a complicated one by using monthly rainfall data. We got it from GMET. And basically, as you can see, we use 19 synoptic uh, weather stations across Ghana, as I've shown on this map. And in terms of distribution of the, the various uh, presentation data that we get, you can see that it captures the rainfall distribution across the different climate zones uh, of Ghana. So going from the north to the south, we see this unimodal pattern in terms of monthly distribution going to the transition, transition zone, where we have like this by uh, uh, modal distribution. And also along the coast, we see this two peak uh, rainfall seasons in the sense of June and September, October, uh, November. So basically, what I'm trying to highlight is that you can see different stations have different distribution. And it's very difficult to kind of use one particular uh, model and generalize it for all, the whole country. And in, in the sense that what we are trying to do that we want to create a model for every specific station. So every specific station will learn uh, the distribution of the rainfall data and also incorporate the local feedback that accounts for the weather in that particular region. So the rainfall data comes from uh, uh, the GMET. And the second, we use the ERA-5 data set, which is a last scale observe uh, a reanalysis. And as you can see from this plot, we use uh, we set these variables as potential predictors, so ranging from temperature uh, to precipitation to pressure to rains on the atmospheric level, relative humidity, dew potential height, 
viewpoint temperature, and we even included large scale uh, synoptic or atmospheric circulation indices like the North Atlantic Oscillation or the Multivariate Enzo or Southern Oscillation Index as predictor. And as you can see here, I'm showing the Pearson correlation coefficient between the rainfall uh, measurement across Ghana and the individual variables. As you can see, for instance, it's obvious that we see significant relationship with the large scale precipitation and the station one, basically uh, highlighting that era five is important in capturing the seasonality of precipitation across Ghana. We see temperature also showing a significant uh, different pattern in terms of seeing positive correlation as we go to the coastal regions and seeing a negative correlation as we move into the northern part of Ghana. And as we, see, we also see that some significant correlation with relative humidity, basically, which also as a physical property for, for rainfall and also atmospheric depot temperature and, and, and many more. So they, in this way, what we can do is that since machine learning models require uh, different independent uh, uh, variables, what we call predictors, we cannot put all these model, these variables into our model because we do not know which of them are useful in predicting rainfall. So what we do is that we set them as potential predictors that a machine learning framework can select from if they think that they are going to help uh, uh, predicting rainfall. And when this model is developed, like I explained, we have to use GCM to kind of support this established machine learning model to generate the, the future rainfall for Ghana. So we rely on the uh, Maslank Institute uh, MPISM SSA model that participated in the SIMIP uh, model experiment. And here we use this model to kind of uh, feed the established machine learning framework by taking the model output from the different uh, emission scenarios. So we go from the low emission to the high emission scenarios. And when we are done, we kind of re reconstruct the predictors that were selected from layer five, feed it to the model and generate the future predictions uh, across Ghana. So the first step that we, we have to do is to kind of have an idea of which of the predictors are useful in terms of the climate variables. So which climate variables is useful for predicting rainfall across Ghana? So that's the first question we ask ourselves. And since I showed you many predictors, we do not, we cannot give the machine learning model all these predictors. So the first thing is that we have to find a way of selecting which of the predictors are very useful. So we use approach, which we call predictor selection with the machine learning framework that we use to select important and predictive uh, selectors. And what we do is that here in the model, we've implemented three different approaches, but here we only use the recursive uh, predictor selection, which is basically like a stepwise regression where you keep adding the predictors to the model until you have a very significant improvement of the performance and in the sense that they kind of also serve like a physical drivers for the climate variability of, of the particular region that you, you, you are interested. So we also, the same way we give error and GMAT the, into the model, we use recursive uh, uh, predictor selection approach and this will select the best predictor for a particular station. So every station would have its own predictor that are useful in generating uh, rainfall feature prediction. And as a result uh, of that, some key results here, I'm showing you the predominant predictors that were selected across Ghana. So here I'm showing the number of stations that was like included a particular predictor. And here I'm showing the individual uh, predictors. You can see, for instance, uh, uh, temperature, uh, PP is total precipitation. You can see that total precipitation was selected in almost all the stations that we use, basically justifying that when we take a large scale precipitation, it, has, it kind of uh, also accounts for the local scale variability of rainfall that we measure in a specific, a specific region. We can also use uh, some of the rains related uh, kind of uh, Meridona and Petrica, uh, uh, Meridona and Zona rains are selected, relative humidity were selected, and this also basically kind of accounts for the West African monsoon dynamics uh, across the area because we need, because of the, the transport of rain coming from the tropical Atlantic into the continent. So the rains are very, plays a major role in determining whether a rain will drop at a particular uh, region or not. So all these rains are also captured in most of the station. And the last is most important is the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is the atmospheric mode of variability in the Atlantic. It was also included in almost like around six uh, stations, which is important, which means that our approach can also account for last scale atmospheric variability. And it's not only statistically driven, but accounts for the physical drivers of rainfall across Ghana. So when we have established the predictors that we think they are useful for a particular uh, region, the next one is, is the question of which machine learning model are we going to use for the model training? 
So here, what I'm trying to show you is that we, we try to find the best model that works for a, a specific region. So in this schematic framework, what we do is that we take the data from 1979 to 19, uh, 1979 to 2012 as our training period. Then we do this training in a cross validation framework, which means that we divide the data into 10 folds and always train it online and use the remaining one as a test to kind of validate our, our, our model in the training period. So what we do is that we still use the R5 and the GMET uh, uh, rainfall data, we fit into a model, then we get our, our prediction. And what we do is that we validate this prediction and check which of these models are best. So because we have implemented this in, in, a, in a very design model, we can test this with very simple lines of code by experimenting which of these models are very important for predicting rainfall in Ghana. So we go with a stack and an ensemble model, random forage, random forest is a tree-based model, and SGBoost is a tree-based a tree ensemble model to a neural network or regularized model, or even a, a Bayesian uh, regression approach. So all these are different machine learning family of models that you can use when you have any regression problem. And what we do is that we test these uh, different models to kind of select the best particular approach for generating rainfall in Ghana. And with some results related to this, as you can, I'm showing this particular plot here, I'm showing the, the cost validation uh, R square. And basically what it means that when you have uh, one, it means that the model is very, very accurate. When you have zero, it means that the model can only predict the mean. And when you have negative, it means that the model was, is not sufficient enough to even predict the mean. And as you can see, we tested the different models. We go from uh, regularized models to a Bayesian model to random forest, to SD boost, a bug and other boost and rate regression. We tested this model and as you can see, the different models shows different distribution. So here I'm showing you a, a, a box plot, basically showing the distribution of all the 19 stations that we use in Ghana, the performance. And basically you can see that the model even performs up to around like 0 0.58 performance, even ranging from some of them even going up to even negative, which means it was bad. So from this model, we can, we can have an idea of which of the models work across the country. So from this, we can rule out basically that SD boost is not a very good model for Ghana. Other boosts did not work. For instance, we can also say that a rich regression is not sufficient to predict rainfall across Ghana. And as you can see, these models kind of to a promising result. And the question that we ask ourselves is that can we benefit from these four models that show that the performance looks promising? And what we decided to do is that, okay, we will have an ensemble way of combining the information learned from these four different models to have a better prediction. So what we decided to do is that we decided to use what we call stack and regressor, which is basically an, an ensemble model that learns from different models sequentially. So what it does is that, so we use the reanalysis and the station measurement to kind of uh, train these different models. They will have their predictions in terms of future rainfall. Then we will feed these models as a predictor or as an independent variable to one particular model. Here we use an extra tree algorithm. And what it does is that these extra tree algorithm will learn from the information captured from these different machine learning models. So we are going in a way of kind of using an ensemble approach. And the advantage of this approach is that it increased generability and also increased your biases in a sense that all the information that is captured from these individual machine learning model will be propagated into an ensemble that will be learned in, on a sequential framework. And once this is kind of uh, also learned from the individual machine learning predictions, we also calibrate this into our final model, then we feed our global climate model output to this model and we get our station based prediction, basically. And a result of that is that we, when we did that, we see that all the, our uh, our cross validation R square improved by 10 to 30 percent, basically even going to up to 0 0.7, which shows that the, the result is very promising. And basically, even though this kind of uh, 40 percent up to 50 percent kind of medium prediction looks that is not uh, kind of accurate enough, but believe me, predicting precipitation dynamics using and a perfect prognosis approach is very, very complicated. So having a performance that is even up to 70 percent shows that the result is very accurate and we can have an important uh, information in terms of uh, climate information that are very high, highly accurate. So what we did was that since I, I mentioned in the previous slides that we used uh, the rainfall data going from 1979 to 2017. So we used 19, uh, 1979 to 2012 as our training period 
then we would we test the model from 2013 to 2017. So what this basically means that the, the, the data from 2013 to 2017 did not go into the model training at all. So this particular data was kept outside the model training. The model did not see this data. And now we want to see that when we use the model that we've trained from here, which is our second model, when, and we apply it on the data from 2020 to 2017, would, would the model be able to predict this? If the model will be able to predict this, then we can trust that it can do a good job in predicting future climate change. So this is basically what we call the testing period in the machine learning framework. And what we did was that we, here I'm showing you some few examples, like from Navrongo, uh, Sinyani, and Azim. And as you can see from this scatter plot, I'm showing the predicted uh, values and the observed values. And basically, uh, as you can see, for the black points are the, the values that were in the training period, which is uh, basically 1981 to 2012, then the, the, the red ones are the ones that we, we tested it that the model did not see. So we are trying to see if the model will kind of show a consistent uh, in terms of prediction and observe. And as you can see, they all follow a linear trend and doing a piercing correlation between the predicted and observed. We see a performance even up to 0 0.84, 0 0.93, and 0 0.96, which basically shows that the model performance is very uh, accurate. In terms of the, the R square, which is the coefficient of determination, basically the explained variance, we see that the performance is 0.53 and also 0.569 for Azim. Basically, meaning that we are always 59% sure that the model will perform better than just predicting the mean, which is a very uh, good information and also a robust way of evaluating uh, the model performance. So, long story short, what I have presented so far is that we have tried to use a robust way of performing downscaling across Ghana. We, we tested it in using like a very sophisticated um, uh, evaluation approach. And basically the performance of the results basically shows that our approach of using machine learning to generate high resolution climate change information specifically for rainfall is very accurate and looks promising. And now back to the schematic diagram that I showed you. So we use the error, the station, we go into the machine learning framework, we get our calibrated model which is where we have reached now. Now we know that the model is performing right. Now the next thing we do is that we feed the GCM output to this machine learning framework. Then we can get the future predictions for a particular station as seen for, as, as shown for this particular image. So that is the next step that we am, I'm going to present on. So what we did was that we feed these different GCM output to the, our established machine learning framework. And here I'm showing you the seasonality and the annual climatologies uh, of, of future projections. So you can see, so from this plot, I'm showing you the precipitation uh, in terms of the observed period from 1981 to 2012. Basically, you can see that in December, January, February, the whole period is dry in the, in the rainfall data that we have. And basically in June, July, August, we see that uh, the, the signal is getting more blue, which means that there's more rainfall. And what we did was that now we come to the future, which is basically towards the end of century, which is from 2070 to 100, what will be the rainfall pattern uh, across the stations, across Ghana, basically moving from the north to the south. As you can see, then from this particular plot, you can see that when we have a higher emission, which is the 8.5 scenario, you can see that all the northern part of Ghana, most of the stations becomes drier. And as we move to the coastal regions, we see some stations showing that it's going to be better or so increasing in precipitation. So long story short, what we have shown here is that most stations uh, is showing a drying pattern of about 10 degrees uh, decrease in, in, the, in the northern side of Ghana. And we also see that there's a shift in seasonality. So in the observed period, which is from 1981 to 2012, we see that December, January, February are mostly the dry period. But in our future predict predictions, we see that the, the month of, of uh, uh, the, the month is, uh, of May is becoming kind of uh, the, the, the point that we see most dry period. So in future or getting to the end of the century, we will also experience a shift in seasonality, which is basically important information for people kind of in, 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 in agriculture and or even for water resource planning that, you know, we will experience a shift in seasonality in, in, in future. And our machine learning way of doing this, you can see that we see that every station has its own variability, which means that the machine learning incorporates the local feedback for a particular location and do not generalize the performance for all the stations across Ghana. And it is important because in Ghana, we, can, we have different climate zones and they all have different kind of climate uh, variability. 
So what we were thinking of it is that, okay, now in terms of time series, what, what would be the trend of, of precipitation in the future? So here I'm showing you the precipitation anomalies with reference to 1979 to 20, uh, 2021. And here I'm showing the prediction for the high emission scenario. And as you can see, I'm showing the uh, interstation means, which means that I'm only considering the northern part of Ghana, basically Bolgatanga, Navrongo, Wa, and Bole. I'm just finding the mean of the future predictions for these particular stations. And as you can see, we see kind of a tremendous decrease in rainfall as we go into the into the end of the century. So basically after the mid-century, we see that the rainfall pattern basically drops to, to the negative pattern, basically showing that there's a decrease of up to around 40% after the mid-century. So long story short, the northern part of Ghana is going to experience a very dry condition towards the end of the, the century. And basically when it comes to the transition zone, basically trying to average only these three stations, you can see that the, the performance vary within the, the, the natural variability. We do not see a particular trend. We just see kind of an increase and decrease pattern of up to 10 plus or minus 10% uh, 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 in terms of uh, its comparison to the reference period. And when we go to the, the, the southern part of Ghana, basically capturing most of the coastal regions, we can see that the precipitation pattern basically start increasing towards the end of the century. So the overall story that I'm trying to show here is that the northern part of Ghana is going to experience mostly drying conditions. The transition zone, we do not have like a clear future, but as we go to the southern part, we can see that most of the stations are showing a kind of increasing pattern, uh, which is up to around to 10 to 20% increase. Basically trying to show that we will experience more flooding kind of, uh, we should expect more flooding situations across the southern part of Ghana and a more drought condition across the northern part of Ghana. So what we were also thinking of it is that, okay, can we compare our downscale product with the raw GCM output that has a lot of challenges? And basically this plot, I'm showing you the precipitation uh, uh, that we predict for future in terms of from 2070 to 100 and how it compares to the, the GCM outputs that we use, which is the MPISM and also different GCMs like the CSM5 and HAT. Gem 2, that was part of the semi uh, uh, projection. And we even compared with the Codex, which is the original climate models. And as you can see, our model is the one in black. As you can see, we see differences in every station. And as we go towards the coastal regions, the difference between our prediction and, and the different uh, GCMs and RCM gets bigger. So basically what we are trying to highlight here is that towards the coastal regions, the GCMs struggle to give us accurate prediction. They really show very unrealistic pattern, even showing a rainfall uh, a, a, a monthly uh, a climatology of up to 2200 millimeters per month, which is very huge as compared to what the other models are predicting. So we are able to capture some of the biases and correct some of the biases for most of the stations across Ghana, and we provide a very high, accurate, high resolution climate change information, which basically highlights that our approach is very promising and so consistent with what the global climate models are predicting. So towards the end of uh, my pres presentation, as a sum up, so basically what I've learned so far, I hope that I've been able to demonstrate the potential of using empirical statistical downscaling in Ghana, basically our package that we developed what we call PI ESG. And I hope that uh, I've been able to kind of uh, develop downscaling products across Ghana that are very highly resolution, showing that the results showing a robust approach and also that is reproducible. All the results that I have presented here can easily be reproducible by just using the script that we use and the package and you can easily get the same results without any difficulties. If you want to improve it, you can also build upon it by adapting our code and use it to generate the same results. And I hope that I have highlighted some of the challenges that the community can come together to develop. So some of the challenges that as you can see, we only use 19, uh, kind of synoptic weather station across Ghana. We can extend it to many stations. And also, since we also use one GCM output to couple their model, we can also improve it by adding many GCMs as a way of uh, in, uh, having a, an accurate uh, future projections of rainfall uh, across Ghana. And the models that we use were strictly evaluated. We do not show this overfitter trend of showing the 100% performance, but we show a realistic uh, performance that we have up to around 70 performance in terms of uh, model accuracy. And what we, we have shown is that using an ensemble machine learning framework can help to improve the prediction of rainfall 
uh, across Ghana. Basically, here we use the stacking regressor, and we show that using a stacking regressor that has an ensemble of many different machine learning shows an improvement in the performance of the, the, the prediction of rainfall across Ghana. So as an outlook of what we can come together as a community to develop in future, here, one thing that we can do is that in, in, our, in my presentation, what I use is like I use only one GCM output to couple to the, the established model. We can come together to use uh, an ensemble of GCM output to kind of couple to the machine learning model to have a future climate change projection from different GCM output. We can also come together and also extend the modeling framework to daily records a daily uh, records by basically calculating or even analyzing extreme conditions that is expected in, in, in the country. So we can extend the monthly framework that we use to daily to basically have an idea about extreme uh, events. And we can also kind of repeat the same modeling framework that I presented by instead of relying on rare analysis data of RFI, we can use different rare analysis data to see if the performance kind of uh, affects the, the projections of rainfall across Ghana. And basically, last but not the least, we can also couple the downscaling product to sector models like flooding uh, models or hydro system models to basically uh, uh, estimate how much rainfall uh, or how much uh, uh, water availability we will have in future across uh, the whole country. And basically ending my story, what I'm trying to highlight here is that we can also incorporate spatial transfer learning in the machine learning by using some of the recent graded climate data uh, products across Ghana to also kind of find a way if we can also have a spatial representation of our model and learn from it using machine learning and AI models. And basically, at the end of my, my, my presentation, what I'm trying to highlight here is that there are a lot of things that we can do and there are a lot of things that we can improve in, in generating high resolution climate information across Ghana using empirical statistical downscaling. If you want to contribute to this package, if you want to collaborate, or if you want to learn how to use the Python package, you can scan the uh, GitHub uh, code and reach out to me by sending me email, and we can basically discuss uh, if you how to use it and also how to find a better way of providing high resolution information across Ghana. And also, if you are also doing anything related to climate or Earth system in general, and if you want to participate in the in the European Geoscience Annual Meeting, which happens in Vienna. And every year, which is coming, which will happen in, in April, we, you can scan this QR code and submit an abstract. The deadline is on the 10th of January. But if if you want to consider, if you want to be considered for a travel uh, grant, you can, you have to submit the abstract letters by December 1st. You can scan this QR code and check the session and 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 try to see if you can apply. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope that we have a, a fruitful discussion after this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. Before we move to the questioning, I'm actually sorry, because when we were doing the introduction, I skipped a few parts. So Mr. Daniel Watson is actually a researcher at the University of Tobingen, Germany, and also a research associate at Equitech. All right, before I move on, I have three questions. Or before I open the floor for questioning, I have three questions. So I'm going to begin with the first one. Um, Mr. Watson, okay. with the issues with reanalysis data, you give us a structure of, of how the whole model works. It uses a reanalysis data, it uses the GMS data before it couples everything and starts using the GCM models. So when my question yeah. is, in case if there, there are gaps in, let's say, the station data you are using, is it that the reanalysis data complements it? And let's say when you have an issue with the reanalysis data to you, the station data complements that one to you. Okay, so this is a very important question. So just to repeat the question, so what he's asking is that if we have a, a missing data in our observation, would the reanalysis data uh, complement that or not? And the answer to this question is that we do not really, the, the reanalysis do not account for any missing data. What it does is that it tries to find a way to kind of uh, uh, represent the large scale conditions ac across the whole place and kind of related to the observation. And basically in our modeling framework, if you have a missing data in, in, your, in your observe, uh, in, in your, your weather station, we remove all time periods that have missing data. So the model do not account for any missing values because in the future, we are not going to have any missing values for the global climate model output that we feed 
into the into the machine learning model. So we will remove every missing period from the, the model training period and only rely on the data that was available. So the error analysis, what it does is that because we are using a regional means, you know, the idea is that climate models are very good in capturing the large scale uh, 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 pattern. So we use regional means from error, basically trying to say that the station can learn from the large scale patterns and put in a machine learning framework in the sense that we can propose to the GCN to have a realistic uh, future projection. All right, thank you very much. And please to my second question, uh, GMS is actually more of an operational field, even though we do research here. So I was about asking, how operational can this model be utilized over Ghana? So, so this is a very uh, well-designed uh, uh, model. So it's very, uh, uh, very easy to use. We've developed it in such a way that you can install it everywhere by just using pip install by ESD. And in terms of operationalizing it, it's, it's not that difficult because all the performance or all the modeling routines that I presented in this particular work, the course can easily be adapted. So it's very easy for GMED uh, uh, to use the model to kind of uh, provide high resolution climate change uh, across Ghana, even if they want to use it on a daily uh, 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 record. So we can well, easily uh, uh, further discuss this in, in after this presentation, and I'm ready to guide GMED to use the, the model if they want to analyze it for a specific task. Yeah, hello. Yeah, sorry. I, I don't know if you. Uh, we we actually trying to resolve the issue. All right, Mr. Watson, please you can continue. Yeah. So what I was trying to say is that the the model is well designed, uh, and is very easy to install in every platform. And learning the model is very easy. You can check the GitHub. We have the website where we have a documentation of the package that can easily be learned. So if JMET wants to operationalize this in trying to find a way or tell a story about different climate uh, variables, how they are going to change in the future, it's a very easy tool that JMET can adapt. And I'm willing to provide all the assistance that JMET might need. All right, thank you very much. And to my last question, when you were present and you actually used a data set uh, spanning from uh, 79 to 2012 mm -hmm. and you said yeah. it was able to couple the results for 2013 to 2017 yes yeah so i'm asking that why didn't you rather use the current climate uh, climatological window which is spanning from 91 to 2020 and also maybe we could compare it to the output let's say the climate window of 81 to 2010 could provide us but rather we use the 79 to 2012. Yeah, so this is a very important question. So when we started this project, uh, we were looking for rainfall data. And as you, you already know, I, I was looking for collaborators uh, who are working in Ghana to extend this study. And we, I reached out to uh, Dr. Jeffrey. And at that time, when we were trying to, to start this project, Dr. Jeffrey uh, uh, only had the data from 1979 to 2017 that we could use to kind of test. So we are open to send this data to the current records, which is up to 2022 or up to 2023, and, and basically try to, it will even help us because we will have a lot of data and a lot of accurate information that a machine learning model can really learn from. So we were not, we, we, we didn't really have access to the data. That's why we could not send this and records. Okay, thank you very much. Then I'm sure uh, years ahead of the weeks I will collaborate and actually provide provide the current data set so that we could work on it and see how operational operationalized we can work with this stuff. So thank That'd you. That would be very, very useful. Thank All right. you. All right, thank you. So please uh, the floor is open for further questioning. So please, if you can unmute yourself and also ask your question, you can write it in the chat and I'll read it out to Mr. Boyson for answers.
Mr. Watson. Yeah. Yeah, please, as we move on, we are waiting for questions. One, one extra question. So we realize we have global models and regional models, but with your research, um, I'm really trying to ask if you use both or we actually uh, go back to the regional ones. So uh, like I explained in our presentation, so when you have kind of learned anything from the real analysis and the station, you know, the calibrated model is open for any particular model. So one advantage of our approach is that, you know, you can actually feed this particular uh, calibrated machine learning model with regional model or, climate, uh, uh, or global model. So it's still an area of research that we can improve on by comparing if we feed uh, the model with climate mod, uh, global climate models or regional models, is there any difference? So you are right, the model is open to any particular uh, future output, whether it's coming from regional climate model or global model. But okay. in our approach, we just tested it for the global models now. And okay. I think, yeah, you're right. Future research, we can all kind of come together to find a way to also try with the regional climate model to okay. actually assess the difference. So yeah, speaking about the empirical statistical downscaling method, you said it's flexible, needs slower computational requirements. So compared to other, let's say, um, statistical models that maybe are not less flexible and do not require less or a very low computational requirements, which one will be effective? Is it the ones that require higher ones or we can still get stuck to the empirical statistical downscaling and still attain results compared to the ones that really need high computational requirements are not really flexible? Okay, so that's that's an important question. So basically from this slide, like as I mentioned, we have like three different uh, in terms of uh, methods for doing statistical downscaling, right? All these methods, they have the advantage and disadvantages. You know, for bias correcting, for instance, I think most uh, studies that I read about Ghana use bias correcting and some also use the weather generator that was developed by uh, Ro Robert Rubio, uh, Robio and colleagues. So the, this approach, the advantage of our approach is that for you to do a bias correction, you need to use a specific GCM, right? But for our approach, you don't need a GCM. You know, you can use just the real analysis or data and observation, and you can couple it with any GCM. So that's number one. And number two, our approach is bias free. So there's no propagation of bias coming from the global climate model to the machine learning model. And the, the reason why this is not normally used in terms the perfect prognosis is normally used is that it involves a lot of uh, te technical challenges. You know, you need to find which predictors are good. You need to find a way of constructing them in terms of transformation. You need to find a way of explaining them. You need to find a way of mod uh, validating them and in the end, couple them to BCM. So many researchers do not go for the perfect approach, uh, prognosis approach because it's very complicated. And that's why we are trying to find a way to make this open access oh. and implement a tool that everybody can use. So we can compare this with previous bias corrections or weather generators models that I think there are some models that are available also very easy and simple to use to see how we like the, to see basically the difference in terms of future predictions uh, across Ghana. I recently kind of collaborated with Robert who uh, designed uh, one of the common uh, uh, downscaling model basically to find a way to design a benchmark for doing downscaling across the whole world. Uh, so you are right, we can try to use different downscaling uh, softwares, whether they are faster or slower, and compare to see how they differ from each other. So basically, I'm just advocating that the whole community comes together, then we sit down and we, we kind of design an experiment and validation framework that we can all use in providing accurate downscaling across Ghana. I don't know if that uh, was uh, answered your question enough. Hello? Yeah, hello, Mr. Watson. Yeah. Okay, so there are two questions in the chat box.
okay so with the first one the person is asking does he have plans on organizing a, tra a training session for people who are interested in working in the pools in completed in the PUI e ESD? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a very good, good question. So, I mean, I would like to organize something uh, in terms of training people on how to use it. Uh, but I think if it comes up as a community effort, that'll be very useful that, you know, we, we try to, kind of set a meeting where everybody who is interested in doing downscaling will come together. You know, we do a workshop and basically design an experiment or design a modeling framework where we will say that we are coming together as a community to provide information about future climate change uh, uh, patterns across Ghana. And basically out of this workshop, we can provide training, we can come together, write a, a, a very useful paper trying to uh, highlight the experiments that we want to perform do it, the work and share the work uh, and so that everybody will be on the same page that, okay, this is the information about climate change that, you know, we, we are getting from the empirical of scale downscaling perspective. So for doing the training, I think I can do it, but if it comes as a community effort, that will carry more weight in, in the sense of organizing a workshop. But of course, if individual person is also highly interested in, in learning how to use this, I'm always open and willing to help. Okay, thank you. A question from Mr. David C. Abiko. He's asking, I am wondering if you had if you had made a direct contact with those authors who have done works on the statistical downscaling in Ghana so far to authenticate your position on the uh, sorry, irreproducibility of their runs. Just trying to be sure that your argument is justifiable. Yeah, I, I think so. That's that's a very good good point but you know basically when we ha talk about ir the irreproducibility of research output so the idea is that i do not have to really contact the author before i can reproduce the work you know and and this is idea of uh, open science so if your science is open your data your methods your model everything that you use the method is well enough communicated in the sense that someone can easily reproduce it without you the author yourself so for example, in terms of data, you know, when we started this particular project, I reached out to many people that uh, did downscaling in the past from the papers that I, I read. And none of them were willing to kind of collaborate or, or willing to share the, the data that they use. So in the end, I was struggling to even find a way to do this because they've done something. I wanted to validate it and repeat using a different approach, but none of them was willing to share the data. So that's number one. So, and basically the tools that they use they are not a tool that everybody can, everybody has access to. So this makes it a challenge. And, and, and basically what I'm trying to, to say here is that if you have a research output, that is very important and, 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 and carries a very critical information about a specific region that people will rely on for future uh, research. You know, you need to be able to provide all the tools and data that you use so that your figures and the results are highly reproducible. So in terms of contact, uh, contacting people to check if we can highly reproduce their work, uh, I think that, that would have been useful, but that, that's not the purpose of trying to say that your work is uh, uh, highly reproducible. I hope uh, I managed to, to answer your question. Thank you very much, please. The floor is open for questions. I don't know if Jeffrey wants to add in something about reproducibility of, of research output because uh, Jeffrey was the person that I, I, I managed to reach out when it comes to really doing this work with the colleagues that I, I, I said at the beginning of the slide. And we even struggle at the beginning to even find data to do this uh, amazing work. So uh, I think, you know, basically coming together as a community to find a, a best way of doing science is much uh, useful than producing research output that basically tell a story, but nobody can use it in, in, in to do uh, any impactful work. Oh, okay.
please, Doctor, I, if you want to add something, you can please go on. Uh, no, no, no. I was just actually going to say, I mean, that's a great presentation first, uh, Neil. I hope that findings that he's presented and then the method he's also put out there wouldn't just, you know, we, we wouldn't just consume it from here and then we leave it hanging. But okay. We should have people, you know, take it up and, then, you know, try to do good stuff. Uh, I think we still have a long way to go as, you know, as a country. And it will be ideal that we, you know, build on science. We'll make it more progressive. Yeah. So, I mean, that's all I would have to say. And, and I think his point on the reproducibility is very, very key. I mean, there are a lot of researchers on this platform at the moment. That I think the way forward now is to have, um, not just do the research in silos alone, but even when we are done, you know, make the really accessible and then also easy to work with. When it comes to data, there are some issues, for instance, when it comes to uh, proprietary data, when it comes to institutional data, you know, it has to go through a protocol. So that we understand. But that's why I was asking, um, I think I asked you backstage, Danny, um, whether there's, you know, there's any plan. Maybe that'll be a question to GMET or maybe to Danny, if there's any recommendation for, you know, when it comes to data, let's say the climate community being able to, you know, get easy access to data and work with it, where do we stand? Um, so please, when it, when it comes to the data provision, um, we are sure we are in a good position to give you the, the most current data you can actually use for it. And we are also open, like hoping to work with this because if we can make it operational, I'm sure it's going to increase productivity with our uh, with our institution and that of the stakeholders involved. So a quick one, um, I'm really uh, concentrated on flood and since when we realize uh, current affairs, we realize floods and droughts is actually causing issues over the country. So mine is that with, with respect to flood and droughts, or let's say the extreme events over Ghana, how does the, the output uh, teach us to know whether maybe there's flood going to happen in this year, or it's just going to forecast for, let's say, rains in those years, and per the analysis it gives us, we can actually have an input that, okay, so when we are in the rainy season, we are expecting an amount of rainfall like this, or let's say per the statistical view you are seeing, let's say rainfall is going to be higher than the previous year. So maybe this and this is what we are supposed to put in place to actually prevent the the most uh, recent floodings that are going on. I don't know if you get the question well. Yeah, I think that's a very important question. So when we started this work, you know, we, 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 we first, so the focus now is just to assess the climatology. You know, what, what is the climat climatological trend? in terms of uh, in response to different emission scenarios. So that, that's the focus. So like I said, as, at the end of the presentation, as a recommendation, we can use the same approach, but rather use the daily uh, rainfall records, which basically sometimes captures uh, the extreme uh, rainfall that we are talking about it, right? So what we can do is that with this, when we're able to generate a uh, daily rainfall for a specific day, uh, station, then with this, Kind of uh, future predictions we can use it to perform the statistics to kind of have an idea uh, the the expected extreme events across the country and also with flooding for instance we have uh, other models that predict flood or uh, quantify flood risk in a specific region so if we're able to use this approach to kind of provide daily records of rainfall through uh, the the whole century then it means that we could use this one to also kind of you know have a say about the expected uh, flooding across the country. So the model can generate daily rainfall for specific stations, which can also give us an idea about the, the, the climate risk or the climate extremes that we should expect in the future. All right, thank you very much. Please, when we go to the chat box, we have two questions again. One is from Eben. He's asking with the community engagements or in the training, how is the proposal going to be done to you? Uh, I think, I mean, I, I think Jim Ed can also I mean, take the lead on this. I mean, I think oh, Jeffrey from KNWST can also, you know, we come together, you know, we said one particular day, an online workshop where we can spend our time to discuss this in detail, you know, do some tutorials and, you know, introduce the package to people or other existing packages. Then, yeah, basically, 
you know, after the meeting, discuss what is the best way that we can do this. And from there, maybe, yeah, we, we, we could have like a community of that basically provide a high resolution climate change information across Ghana. I think this is just to be done in a community effort base because uh, the number of papers that I've read from Ghana, from individual researchers trying to tell a story about future is, is quite not good because, you know, it's like about people are focused on just publishing the results, but not actually communicating the uncertainties and the reasons behind the results that they have. So I, I feel like if we come together as a community where everybody's interested, we'll be part of it and we all sit down and do this and everybody will be involved. You know, it will carry more weight. And I think in the IPPC report, where there are many authors from Ghana who are participating, can also use this particular information to kind of tell a story about what is going to happen across Africa. And basically, if we do this as a pilot study for Ghana, other African countries can also learn from us, you know, and transfer the protocols that we would design in, in, the, in, in their countries and also basically do the same to, find, to kind of uh, generate information for a set of climate change uh, 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 patterns. Oh, okay. So I'm sure most of the organizers are also online. So we will do a follow-up on this. And if there will be an engagement, I'm sure it will be communicated from the heads and we will reach out to Dr. Jeffrey and yourself and we'll see how to go about the engagement. Thank you very much. Please, we are still opening for questions. Okay, so if there are no further questions, we would like to thank you, Mr. Daniel Barton, for a great presentation. And we appreciate you for the efforts you've actually shared to give us a great insight into your work. And we also would like to thank Dr. Jeffrey for hand, uh, giving you a helping hand for this project. Please, if there are no further questions, as I said, we can turn on our microphone, uh, our camera, so we take, a, we take pictures. So please, if we can turn our cameras on so we can take a good picture. So please, on on a count of three, we will take the first one. One, two, three. So please, again, we go one, two, three. All right, so thank you everybody for joining the 20 feet meteorological seminar organized by Jemret, KNUST and Swift Africa. We are grateful for coming on board. Please, the video will be made available to, uh, to those that are actually registered to your mails. We are going to send it. And please, also, the next, which is the 20 seat meteorological seminar, will be in next month, which will be communicated to you as time goes on. Thank you very much. And thank you for all joining. Bye-bye.